Hey folks, welcome back to another Data Science 1 lecture. Uh, today we're going to talk about unsupervised learning, so specifically clustering and dimensionality reduction. So just to orient us uh, again, uh, we've been talking about some of the supervised learning methods for the last few lectures, uh, both regression and classification and linear and nonlinear models. Um, and we're going to, to move over this time uh, to again broaden out the, the set of models that we can think about for our projects. Uh, to also talk about unsupervised learning. So we're going to go into uh, clustering and dimensionality reduction as, as two of the broad classes in unsupervised learning today. So uh, with supervised learning, uh, again, the goal was to create uh, a function that maps inputs to outputs. These are models uh, that, that expect to you to have an output value or a true label. Um, for at least some subset of your data that you're using to train this model. Now we can uh, think about this as regression as, or as classification, but both of these are supervised learning methods, so they uh, assume that you have this training data. By contrast, the unsupervised learning methods that we're going to talk about today uh, look for patterns in unlabeled data. Uh, so you can think of this kind of more in the, the spirit of an exploratory data analysis where we're not necessarily trying to fit a specific model, but asking about what patterns uh, happen to, to live in this data. Um, and so uh, we, we don't have these specific input-output pairs or, or even oftentimes specific hypotheses about what we're looking for uh, when we do unsupervised learning. So this uh, presents uh, some challenges setting up the problem or interpreting the problem perhaps, uh, but is, is really nice in that uh, you can come at the problem with a much more open-ended uh, kind of exploratory view and, and just kind of see what falls out of patterns in the, the data that you have. So in, in this vein, we'll start with, uh, with clustering here. So the goal of clustering is if you have uh, some set of data to pull out the uh, the patterns um, of what clusters live in in your features uh, uh, in the features of your data. So you can uh, see in our example to the right here uh, that probably even without drawing in these these three circles, you could have guessed that uh, that the data clusters into three different groups. Um, and and it's not entirely clear yet, just from knowing this, which the uh, what what the three groups correspond to. Um, but depending on our problem, that might be really informative just to know that there are three groups and, and we can go in uh, and maybe do some more uh, description and exploratory data analysis on each of those separate groups uh, to try and figure out what's happening inside of them. Uh, but uh, this clustering is something we can do even without knowing what, what group uh, fits where. So uh, there are lots and lots of examples of when you would want to cluster data uh, without knowing beforehand what the, the groups or labels are going to be. And then you can maybe go back afterwards and look for what patterns or trends exist in, in the clusters that you found. Um, and, and this, uh, as I just mentioned, is when you don't have a specific hypothesis um, or, or really even understanding of what the distribution of your data looks like, but you're just trying to find groups of data points uh, in this Netflix example, groups of, of people uh, who cluster together with, with common interests or common features. And that's uh, exactly the, the approach that we'll be taking here for, for clustering data of, of any sort. Uh, so uh, again, we're uh, looking at uh, not necessarily training uh, predictive models. Um, but uh, by doing some sort of, of pattern detection to give us a taxonomy of what sort of groups might exist in our data and what the relationship between those groups might actually be. So to, to get a little bit more uh, hands-on into this, uh, let's talk about uh, just a couple of clustering algorithms because I think that's really helpful uh, to, to be able to visualize what this process looks like. Um, that these, uh, these algorithms are, are fairly simple and uh, like always, uh, they're available in scikit-learn. Uh, so I don't need you to understand the, the implementation of all of these, but, uh, but understanding the, the high level details of the type of clusters that come out of this um, is, uh, is, is important for, uh, for, for determining when and, and how you want to use these clustering techniques. So the first uh, and, and perhaps simplest is k-means clustering. Um, uh, 
This idea is to have a, a number of clusters and to iteratively uh, move points between the clusters that you have to try and uh, separate the, the, the data that you have into the, the correct clusters. So like many of our iterative, iterative algorithms, this will start out by randomly placing uh, initial conditions, in this case, placing the, the centers of our clusters. Um, and we're going to color each of the, the clusters for our different classes in a, a different color here, just to, to make it obvious. Um, so with, uh, with clustering just two classes, class one and class two, or cluster one and cluster two, um, you can see the, the stars here are going to represent our, uh, our, our hypothesized uh, clusters. And as you can see, we have no idea of any uh, labels for the, the data. They're all black right now uh, because we've come into this problem with, with no priors about, uh, about what uh, clusters or classes uh, these data points belong to. So our first step is to try and assign uh, a cluster to each one of them. And we'll do that simply by looking at uh, which center uh, the data point is, is closer to. So the ones who are closer to the, the yellow cluster or the yellow star or orange star, sorry, uh, will uh, assign them the, to class two. And the ones that are closer to the blue star will assign them to, to class one. Now, uh, the, the next step is since we just randomly uh, assign these clusters is to, to move our center towards the, the centroid of the cluster that we have, uh, which is to say towards the, the mean of the, the K points, which end up uh, representing our cluster. So right now, these, these points are, are somewhat arbitrary based off of our initial conditions. But if we move our centers towards the, the mean of those points, um, depending on, on how big a step we take, we, we'll end up with something that, that looks or, or will eventually look at a number of steps uh, like uh, the actual center of, of those points. Um, from there, we can just rinse and repeat and uh, again, assign uh, our, our data points to the cluster whose center is closest to them. And then again, move the, the, the centers towards the middle of the points, which we just assigned to them. Uh, and we'll repeat this uh, again and again. You can see that, that at least in this example, after just a couple iterations, not much change is happening. Uh, if we do it one more time, just one more data point changes. Um, and, and here at, from iteration four to iteration five, actually none of the data points change. Uh, so, uh, so from here, we've, uh, we have some indication that, that we've you know, converged onto uh, to some reasonable cluster. Um, now, uh, since, since we've uh, stopped changing between iteration four and iteration five, this is the clusters that our k-means uh, clustering algorithm comes up with. Uh, they, they may make a, a lot of sense intuitively if we look at these, uh, these data points in a, a 2D grid or scatter plot here. Um, you might have uh, perhaps uh, classified one of these data points differently. Uh, but but for the the most part they they tend to make sense. Now uh, we can we can keep going uh, with this algorithm as as much as we want, but for the the sake of efficiency, we'll just uh, cut this off as soon as uh, any data points don't move between between two uh, two sequential iterations. So I, I should note uh, also quickly that uh, this k-means clustering approach that we just described uh, is uh, somewhat related, but a, a completely different algorithm than the k-nearest neighbors algorithm that, that some of you uh, who've taken the machine learning class may be familiar with as a supervised learning technique. Um, what we're talking about with k-means is, is an unsupervised learning technique uh, and, and K nearest neighbors is a, a, an approach to modeling that says for any new data point that you, uh, you see at test time, just take the K closest data points in your training set and take the average class between them to try and predict the class of your test set. Um, so they're both using these local neighborhoods that are assuming that points close together uh, in some feature space or, or clustering scatter plot 2D space uh, or, or whatever D your, your problem is um, that, are, that are in these feature space, the, the close together points happen to have the same class. So, so that's an assumption that, that comes into both of these. 
but uh, but k nearest neighbor is supervised, and k means that we're talking about today is is unsupervised clustering. So uh, another thing to note about our k-means algorithm uh, is that, uh, as you noticed, uh, the or, or, or as you, you can imagine, I, I guess we haven't shown an example yet, but but as you can imagine, uh, how you uh, initialize the clusters makes a big difference into uh, where they end up uh, converging to. Uh, in this example, instead of the the two clusters, we've we've shown four. Um, but uh, but as you can see, the the results look very different uh, across the clusters. Uh, and maybe the the center and the the left uh, panel, uh, the the shapes may be fairly similar, uh, but the the ordering of the clusters are different. Um, Typically, we, we won't care that much uh, about this, but uh, but the difference in, in borders between them uh, does make some difference. Uh, in the, the panel to the right, you can see that the, the clusters actually look very different um, in, in how they're distributed across the, um, across the, the set of data here. So the question is, how do we compare these two or, or these three or however many uh, different random seeds you try? Uh, to figure out what the best clustering technique is if you were to randomly initialize a whole bunch of runs on the same data. And there are some ways, like the, the common eye test of figuring out which one looks like it's, it's clustered the best, uh, but, but in general we want to be as objective as we can. Um, and so the, the idea is to look at the clusters um, and to say how far away are the points that are uh, in your cluster. And you can either uh, ask what the the total uh, the total uh, distance is. Usually, we take the squared distance um, from the the points in your cluster, or you can look at the average squared distance uh, for the the points in your cluster of how far they are from from the center of that cluster. Um, and we call this uh, either inertia or distortion. They're they're two very closely related uh, metrics. And then we'll typically use these. Uh, for for our loss functions, and in most of the lecture today, we'll use distortion. Uh, the the scikit-learn implementation, I think, relies more on inertia, um, but they're they're very uh, similar metrics. So if we were to uh, to look at the distortion metric and and look at what the uh, the average uh, squared distance is from each data point to its its class's centroid. Um, we could come up with a, a real valued number that, that lets us compare um, how, how well uh, each of these runs are clustering, uh, where uh, the smaller number, points being, being closer together, uh, is, is obviously better. Um, and then the, the larger number, meaning the clusters are more spread out. And you can see that in the, the pictures here too. So uh, a couple things to, to quickly note. One is that uh, the the cluster on the right that we or the picture on the right that, that we thought uh, had the maybe the the le least intuitive clustering has the the worst metric, um, and that the the two that, that looked fairly similar have also very similar metrics, um, and and maybe uh, may, maybe you can distinguish with with one being better than the other. Um, on the, the two left columns, um, perhaps uh, you could make an argument that there's, there's more even distribution of classes um, in the, the leftmost one. Um, but uh, the, the idea uh, here is if you have multiple trials, uh, the, the uh, one thing you can do is to, to just pick the, the one with the, the best uh, distortion or inertia, inertia metric. Um, and, uh, and we'll get in a, just a minute into an example of uh, how that's actually really important for helping to choose hyperparameters too. Uh, before we get there, uh, the, the hyperparameter choices uh, are, are general across all algorithms, so I'll, I'll just quickly introduce one other approach uh, that deals with one of the, the other issues we saw in the k-means example where we can converge to the minimum inertia or minimum um, our, our minimum loss uh, value, uh, which which means we've we've converged to the the final set of clusters, um, 
with uh, with some data points that, that don't make sense, like that little blue point that was hanging in the, the edge of the cluster uh, for our, our first example of the, the blue and orange two cluster case um, that, that we have right here. So we, we see that uh, that the results we get from k-means don't necessarily always match what we we intuitively think uh, even though the the cluster on the left or sorry the the cluster on the right um, is the one that that has the minimum loss um, and, and has converged we might intuitively think that the the one on the left makes more sense um, and and that's because we're we're just using our loss function we're we're looking at, at minimum distortion um, and and we have no uh, no intuition about what looks good or bad in terms of clustering uh, when we're uh, describing to, to k means how they should uh, how they should uh, distribute the, the data points between the clusters. So uh, if if we're thinking about which one's right or wrong, um, you you could uh, come up with uh, different answers depending on how much you you weigh the uh, intuitive and subjective versus the the more objective version. Um, and there, there's not necessarily a, a right answer. So uh, let's introduce a, a new clustering idea that uh, that tends to favor uh, the types of classes you see on the, the left here more. Um, and, and that's because uh, unlike k-means, uh, this, this uh, approach we're going to introduce uh, not only looks at the distortion metric, but also considers uh, how much the the classes are, are blobbed together or, or aggregated um, in, in how we uh, how we build the clusters. So the uh, agglomerative clustering uh, approach um, is a, a another uh, another uh, approach to clustering that that does uh, explicitly um, or, or maybe not explicitly, but but you'll see uh, does. Uh, take into account in its methodology the idea of aggregating uh, big clusters together in in space, um, and the the idea here is is really simple, which is that uh, rather than uh, initially assigning some number of clusters and randomly uh, placing them in this space and then moving them towards the the center of their points like we did with k-means, uh, in this case we're going to start with every single data point being its own cluster. Um, and then just say which clusters tend to be really close to other clusters and uh, merge those together. And we'll continue that process until we get down to the, the number of clusters that we want. So let's uh, run through a quick example again here, just uh, finding a couple of clusters um, with, with this approach. Um, so as you can see, we've started out with uh, a, a number of clusters, in this case 12. Um, that uh, that all have just one data point in them, and we'll search over this and look for the the uh, two clusters which are closest to each other, um, and we'll merge those together into one. So uh, you can see that in the the bottom left corner, the the ten and the eleven are, are very close to each other. Uh, so we'll just uh, merge those into uh, a single uh, cluster number for uh, for easy. Uh, um, uh, easy record keeping, we'll assign that to the, the lower clustered numbers, but the, the numbers here are, are totally arbitrary. Um, the next closest uh, values um, are 0 and 4 in this case. Um, so we're going to merge those two together. Um, we're, we're starting to, to get some clumps um, and, and starting to, to form clusters of, of more than one data point. Um, so the, there are a, a couple uh, challenges and, and implementation questions around this approach. And one is uh, how do you deal with uh, cluster, uh, asking for the distance between clusters with multiple points in, in one or both of them. Uh, so we, we see here with, uh, with the three and zero cluster um, that depending on which data point uh, in the, the zero cluster you choose, uh, how far it is away from three might be might be different. Um, we'll uh, for the the example here use the the max distance away, uh, but that's uh, that's just a, an arbitrary choice. Um, I, I think we'll we'll come back to that in a second. But uh, re regardless of of the choice, 
Um, I think that the five and one are, are closer here. So let's uh, just quickly go ahead and, and merge those two together. Um, no, I, I, I guess I was wrong. We, we are going to go to uh, to three and zero. Uh, maybe I just had my, my slides in the wrong order. Um, so uh, when we're, we're looking at uh, comparing multiple points, like I said, uh, we, we can choose different metrics. Uh, based off of k-means, you might think of looking at the, the average uh, distance between them, or that's to say the, the distance of the, the centroids um, or the, the mean points within each cluster. That's certainly a, a good way to go. Um, the, the one that's most common is, is the max distance because that, uh, that reduces the, the span of clusters and, and tries to keep them as tight as they can together. Um, where if you were to use average or, or minimum distance, then you can imagine having these kind of long sprawling clusters um, that, that just need to be connected all the way through, where really what we want is, is all of the points kind of conglomerated together. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll use the, the max distance, and, and from the max distance, now you can, you can see uh, that the distance between 0 and 3 is much less than the distance between 1 and 5. Um, and so, so those are the two that we're going to merge together here now that I have my, my slides back in the right order. Um, so the, we'll, we'll just keep continuing this process until we've gotten down to our, our two clusters. Uh, the, the next one uh, that, that's the closest, um, despite what you might think by, by looking at this picture, um, is actually uh, seven and nine. Um, and, and this actually brings up a, a really important point about uh, all of the clustering techniques uh, that we're going to talk about today, um, which is that they rely, since we're looking at distances in our feature space, uh, they rely very heavily on the, the scale of each of our features. So the, uh, the example here that we have uh, shows the, the, the features in their uh, in their original uh, scale, um, the original uh, centering and, and variance across them. Um, and so uh, it, it isn't totally obvious that, that seven and nine actually are the, the best cluster from, from just looking at these. Um, and, and maybe, maybe they, they shouldn't be. The, the fact that, uh, that since we only go from a scale of about uh, 0 to, to 2.5, on the, the y-axis and, and 0 to 7 on the x-axis uh, means that, that we're uh, looking at uh, differences in our uh, y-axis as, as being kind of uh, much, much more important since they're, they're, they're smaller. Um, the, the way that we can get around this uh, that, that would make the most sense and, and make it so that what we actually see on the, the scatter plot here matches our intuition of, of how things cluster together. And also just to be more fair across different types of scaling that you can imagine, uh, you know, really, really tiny scales and, and huge scales where you would kind of uh, end up aggregating everything on, on one scale first before converging on the other. Um, but uh, but to, to fix all of those problems, the answer is let's just uh, standardize or normalize our, our data first. Um, so in our standardization techniques that we've talked about uh, a number of times here, uh, we'll uh, d subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation uh, to, to get these into a, a zero centered and, and unit variance uh, metric. For the, the sake of uh, not changing up the plot on us here, um, we're, we're going to leave uh, the, the unscaled features for, for this example, but, but note that uh, that uh, standardizing first is something that, that you should always do before running a clustering algorithm. So uh, with, uh, with that in mind, we'll merge uh, cluster seven and nine. Uh, similarly, we'll merge the, the next two closest, which are six and eight. Uh, again, uh, the, the next, even with the, the max value is uh, zero and three, even though, uh, again, it, it doesn't look like it due to the scaling. Uh, that's that's how the the math works out. So we'll we'll merge those together. Uh, we'll merge uh, one and ten, and and so on and so forth. Um, again, here's a, an example of of really unintuitive metric scaling. As you can see, that the the comparison of the the zero to six cluster is is very much on the uh, dimension of the x-axis, where the zero and seven is very much in the dimension of the the y-axis. 
Um, so this really exemplifies the, the point I was making before, um, where uh, the, the units between the zero and, and seven were, were smaller. And so we'll, we'll merge those first. Um, and then merge in the, the uh, six cluster. And I think finally the, the two clusters last. So we've, uh, we've merged all of the, the data points um, and into the clusters until we got down to our desired number, which was two clusters left. Um, and if we uh, take these, uh, this uh, approach and uh, apply the same thing to the, the full data set, uh, which also includes uh, many points I, I left out so that we didn't drag on too far with that example, uh, what we end up with is what looks like our uh, original scaling, or sorry, our original clustering, um, but the, the version with the, the more intuitive kind of blobby structure. Um, and, and you can imagine how this comes about in, in many cases through aggregating clusters together, uh, especially with the, the max distance um, max distance heuristic uh, for comparing clusters. Um, and so, uh, so this is a, another approach that, uh, again, has pros and cons uh, with, with k-means, but is, is a, another thing to consider. And again, is a, an approach that is uh, is pre-packaged uh, for you in, in scikit-learn. So uh, one of the, the hyperparameters that makes the, the most difference here, uh, especially for k-means, but, but also for the agglomerative clustering too, is picking the number of clusters that you want. Um, this is the, the stopping point for our agglomerative clustering, but uh, is, is something that we need from the very start in, in k-means also. So uh, how do we pick the ideal number of clusters uh, with almost any clustering uh, problem? If you were to try and, and look at these ahead of time, uh, you can imagine a number of, of different uh, clusters that, that make sense. And it's, it's uh, really hard to, to choose one. Um, there are some cases where, where it's obvious or, or you have some, uh, some prior based off of some, something else in your problem formulation. And we'll, we'll show an example of that in a second. Um, but for the, the most part, uh, we'll, we'll take a, a very hands-off approach, which is, is generally uh, my preference anyways in, uh, in data science, um, is, which is to compare a, a whole bunch of different cluster numbers and, and see which one works better. Um, the, these clustering techniques are uh, tend to be very fast, and so it's it's quite simple to run, uh, you know, a number of different uh, random trials for a number of different uh, max cluster sizes, um, and and just see which one uh, ends up ends up doing the best. So this is the uh, the average uh, distortion for clusters of one cluster, of two clusters, of three clusters. Um, each using uh, k-means here, um, and uh, and what we can see is that uh, that there's uh, often some trade-off um, that uh, that that we see uh, a really quick uh, uh, drop in our loss metric, and then it, it asymptotes out towards uh, towards uh, whatever our final value is. Um, which, which at the very extreme is just saying that, that each uh, data point is its own cluster um, that, that has um, almost perfect uh, performance. And in fact, that would be zero distortion. Um, but uh, but it, as you can imagine, uh, the, the fewer number of clusters we have tend to uh, make the most sense in terms of aggregating data and, and also be the, the most uh, straightforward to, uh, to uh, intuit and, and describe what those clusters are uh, and, and what their relationships are to each other. And so to, to balance the, the having a, a small number of clusters, but also low uh, loss or, or distortion or inertia, um, we'll try and find uh, what looks like a, a good trade-off um, between the, the marginal increase in distortion and uh, looking at this, I would say you know either two or three clusters tend to to make the the most sense here. Um, which, if if you remember the the shape of our data, um, it it seemed like maybe four clusters was was too many. Uh, two seemed somewhat reasonable, but but we did have that long cluster that that maybe you can think of as, as splitting into um, to to end up with with three total clusters. 
uh, and uh, subjectively, either of those uh, seem to be fine. If if you want to to get a little bit more objective, you can measure uh, the distance between your data point um, of uh, k and and distortion with the the origin, which is the the zero zero point, um, uh, and and ask uh, what's the the closest point to to your to the origin, um, and uh, and what we'll end up with here, I I believe is two clusters for that, but it's it's a, a again very close to to three clusters as well, uh, but that gets just a, a slightly more objective metric. So uh, I, I mentioned uh, the case where, where you might have a number of clusters pre-specified. Um, you could, uh, you know, say that uh, that you have a, a certain number of, of bins to fill. Um, that if you're, you know, dividing uh, or dividing the, the class up into groups for discussion, uh, and we have five breakout rooms to fill, then uh, maybe we have five clusters, no matter how the, the fit works. Uh, here's a, a ex real world example of looking at uh, how you break up uh, sizing in a, a, an online store, um, which might say uh, you know the the size that you uh, cluster your items of clothing into uh, might be uh, three clusters if you're just looking at at small, medium, and large, or it could be five if you're looking at uh, extra small and extra large too, or you know, seven if you include double X and double uh, XS and double XL. Um, that that you, know, you can think of, of many examples like this where uh, there's there's some other consideration you have uh, that's that's specifying uh, how many clusters um, you you uh, you want uh, based off of of some other uh, objective function to minimize. In this case, the the profits from from your store. Uh, and uh, and and you can end up uh, clustering the, the items that you have into the the correct number of bins um, for for the the practical implications that, that make sense in, in your problem too. Uh, for for the most part, I I try to stick with the more objective measures, but uh, but that's a, a a bit more personal preference than a hard and fast rule. So uh, just to to wrap up a, a little bit this uh, this section on clustering and, and quickly talk about dimensionality reduction, um, the the pros of clustering are it's a, a really nice uh, approach to use. Uh, in fact, kind of uh, your one of uh, very few tools you have when you're you don't have labeled data to to try and build a, a model, um, and it's it's nice in that you can uh, find clusters that uh, either objectively minimize some loss function. Uh, or, or visually, you know, uh, make the most sense of, of clustering together uh, blobs in in your uh, in your feature space that, that aggregate into the, the clusters that that might make sense to, to us intuitively, and and usually these two are, are fairly similar. Um, we've we've kind of purposely chosen an example where there's one data point that's different between them. Uh, a few of the, the cons are that uh, you need to specify the, the number of clusters ahead of time. Uh, again, with this being fast, it's, it's not a big deal to just search over a whole bunch of different possible clusters, um, but that's a, a, a clear limitation of, of this approach. Uh, maybe the, the more important limitation is that uh, when we're uh, asking about what we do with these clusters afterwards, uh, just knowing that there are three or five or seven clusters and that the, the data points you have fall into them in this way uh, doesn't necessarily add a whole lot of knowledge or intuition about what your problem is like. Um, and so usually uh, you need some sort of secondary analysis on top of this to go and you know, describe the, the values of the features of your data uh, within each of those clusters to to find out uh, what's what's happening uh, with, within each of them um, in, in terms of the the attributes that they have or if you have some examples of of label data um, you can also look at and see how the the labels distribute between those clusters as well um, and, uh, and and one other point uh, to to make sure to note is that uh, that these are highly dependent on our pre-processing 
um, and, and standardizing uh, is, is a, a good uh, ground rule here to try and reduce the sensitivity to the distance metrics uh, in, in our features that, that might have different scales. Um, and, and this is something that happens whenever you look at you, you know, comparing distances uh, across different features. Um, which which is uh, is is something that that comes up uh, a lot in unsupervised learning. So uh, one of the the things that uh, that you can think about for pre-processing actually relates to our next uh, type of uh, unsupervised learning, which is dimensionality reduction. So the the idea here is to ask. Uh, what the important dimensions of variation are across your data set. Um, and, and that might seem like a slightly silly question uh, at first, um, but we'll, we'll show uh, some examples of, of how this can be really helpful um, for, for a number of things, including, as I just mentioned, a, a really nice pre-processing step. So the, the general idea here is that, uh, that we're going to be running a, a principal component analysis. So um, many of you may have heard about this in, uh, in, in some of your uh, math or stat classes. Uh, if, if you have, that's great. If, if you haven't, that's also totally fine. Again, we're, we're just looking at an intuitive uh, understanding here, and, and these things are, are in scikit-learn as well. So if we have some data set, uh, which is looking at the the uh, growth rates in population across country, and specifically uh, looking at uh, the mortality and, and fertility rates uh, within those countries. We can plot that on our our scatter plot, um, and and as you see, there is uh, you know some relationship between these data points um, that uh, that that describe how this data. Uh, tends to move in this 2D space of uh, mortality and fertility. Um, now, if we were to, uh, to think about what that trend is, uh, an intuitive thing might be to, to fit a regression line through it to look for the, the major trend. Um, and uh, what, uh, what we've done here is actually something that's, that's very similar to that, but, but not quite exactly. Um, we've pulled out the the first principal component, which is is to say the the major trend um, through through our data. Um, it's uh, it's actually the uh, the first eigenvector, which is very slightly different than the regression line. Uh, but for the purposes of our intuitive understanding, you can think of this just as a regression line through our data. Um, they're they're close enough for for now. Um, and uh, and so think of think of this first principal component, uh, our main principal component, as being the main trend through our data, uh, which is to say that uh, that there's a, a trend where uh, the mortality of a country goes up as its fer fertility rate goes up as well. Um, and so uh, so with uh, with that uh, that principal component. Uh, function um, we can uh, we can also then map uh, the the principal components of individual data points too just by mapping them uh, to to that line um, and uh, and and this is something again scikit-learn can can spit out for you is the 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 first principal component um, of of each of these countries so uh, you you may have uh, have noticed something uh, something subtle but but really important here in that uh, in that uh, the principal component the the points uh, along the uh, the um, the the black dotted line here um, is described just with one feature that that says uh, you know how far up or down this principal component line are you. And the uh, the angle that, that tells you uh, what uh, what angle to, to drop these points uh, along the line uh, is determined uh, again by the the eigenvector of of this component, um, which for our intuitive intuition uh, is is just the, the slope. So we've we've found what the relationship exists between our two components, and so the the value of our first principal component is just to say. Uh, for the slope, how far up do you go before you you drop your point? Um, 
And that uh, that seems like a, a funny thing to, to point out, except that it, it what it means is that we can now represent the the main functional relationships and and kind of the the overall trend in this data now through just one column, just through the the first principal component column in our data set. Um, and, and we could do that if we were to uh, ignore the mortality and fertility data to, to remove that from our data set as long as we, uh, we still wrote down the, the slope of what this trend line should be. Um, and, and so that, in a nutshell, is, is how we reduce the dimensionality of our, of our data. We've, we've gone now from, uh, from having uh, 2D data into to 1D data. And, and you can kind of see that it's 1D in that uh, there's only one dimension of variation here in, the, in that it's a, a straight line. So uh, if, if we were to, to think about this, uh, this, uh, um, this, this axis, um, you, we have uh, countries with uh, you know, very high uh, principal component as, as being on the, the bottom left and, and very low values of the principal component being on the, the top right. Um, it's not necessarily the case that, that they go in either one of these directions. It, it just depends on how the principal component uh, gets, gets spun and, and gets fit. Um, but that's, that's how it worked out uh, in, in our data set. Either way, it, it's, it's uh, letting us know that, that this is the main trend of, of variation over our data. Um, and so to make the, the point even more concrete about us going from, from 2D data to 1D data, you can think about taking the, the angle or the slope that we just talked about for our main component and, and just uh, removing that angle. So flattening out the, the trend line onto uh, what's, what's very obviously here, uh, a 1D number line just across the, the x-axis. Um, and so uh, this, uh, this, this again, is, is taking the, the 2D data and turning it into to a 1D, um, uh, a, a 1D uh, a representation. Uh, and this also might, might seem very reminiscent of, of what we just did with residuals, of, of taking away the main trend and just plotting the, the differences that the data points had um, between that trend line and their, uh, their original value. Uh, this is uh, how we talked about residuals and and fitting the the first principal component, the first major trend line, is is kind of like the the first uh, fit we did in our uh, gradient boosting method as well. Um, like, so this is is kind of like the the first model within a, a gradient boosted uh, ensemble or, or tree as well. So we uh, we have what's uh, what's kind of like our residual, our, our main principal principal component here rotated to the, the x-axis. Um, and so, uh, so that's, that's how we, we find our principal components. Uh, now we can keep doing this uh, again and again um, with, uh, with different dimensions of, uh, of, of variation. Um, so in the, the case we, we saw before where we've now flattened the, the trend line, um, so that it's it's horizontal. The the next dimension that that it happens to explain the most data in in our two dimensional case uh, is is of course the the y axis because it's the only dimension left. Um, but if you imagine a, a data set that has more than two columns, that there are you know whatever n minus one columns remaining or n minus one dimensions remaining. Um, of, of possible modes of variation in your, your n-dimensional data set. Um, and so we could repeat this same process again, which is to say uh, with our remaining data, with our residuals from our first principal component, uh, what is the, the primary direction that, that explains the most, date, the most variation within, within the, that leftover uh, residual variation? Um, and, and that will uh, happen to uh, fit a line that is uh, perpendicular or, or orthogonal in multiple dimensions to the line of our first principal component. Um, and so, so what we'll end up with is, uh, is a, a component that, that, as you can see here, is exactly uh, orthogonal or, or perpendicular to the, the original line that, that we just drew. Um, and that's our, our second principal component. And you can keep on doing this for uh, as, as many times as you want, uh, just like you can fit as many regression, or sorry, as many residuals as you want in, in gradient boosting. 
Um, we can find as, as many principal components as we want uh, until we run out of dimensions in our, our data. So uh, with these uh, with these principal components, now we uh, now know the the trend lines that explain the the most variation within our data, and and we can uh, create a auxiliary data set of engineered features, uh, which is much smaller in in dimensionality than our our first data set, um, but captures uh, most of the the major trends. Um, and, and we can choose this to be any number of features that, that we want to, to be considering. Um, so, so that's to say we can take our, our dimension of our original data set and reduce it as, as much as, as we see fit. Um, most often uh, for, for uh, exploratory data analysis, we'll end up going down to, to two dimensions uh, because that's easy to, to put on a scatter plot. And, and that's a, a really nice uh, a way to use this tool is to take some, you know, 10 or 20 or 100 dimensional, uh, 20 dimensional uh, 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 feature set and then fit a regression line that'll be a, a multiple regression line through all 20 dimensions. So it'll have 20 terms in it. Um, but then we'll, we'll use the, the principal component along that to, to be able to plot that on one axis. And we'll do the same thing again, take the second principal component and plot on the other axis. And now we've just taken our, our you know, impossible to visualize uh, data set and we've now crunched it down into to 2D where we can put on a scatter plot and, and look for trends in our data. Um, one of the, the nice way to look for trends is to apply uh, one of the clustering methods that, that we just talked about. Um, but you could also use this uh, to, to feed into a supervised learning method too um, that, that would just take in the principal components as the features of that method. Um, and, and that might be nice if you're using a, a method that, that uh, works best with a small number of input features. Uh, other uh, quick things to, to note about uh, principal component analysis is that uh, it does assume that your data is, is centered around zero. So uh, as, as usual, make sure you're standardizing your, your features before doing this step. Um, and uh, and uh, another uh, kind of quick side note, again, not to get too far into the math, um, but, but since we said that the principal components each were related to uh, eigenvectors, um, the, we, uh, we can also use the eigenvalues of those to weight how important each of the principal components are. Um, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with linear algebra, you can just think that, uh, that the principal components are, are ordered in terms of, um, of, of how important they are, um, but, but there are uh, nice mathematical tricks we can, we can do to, to get even more granularity there and say what the, the ratio of important is, importance is between, let's say, uh, feature one or, or, or principal component one and two or principal components, you know, five and 20, depending on how many you, you end up wanting to make. So uh, to, to summarize PCA really quickly, um, it's, it's great for uh, dimensionality reduction. Um, there, there are a, a handful of, of other related uh, approaches to uh, this idea of, of finding major trends or, or keeping together um, keeping together a uh, structure of our data when we crunch down into fewer dimensions. Um, but principal component analysis is, is perhaps the, the most well-established and, and most commonly used. Um, and, and it's really nice because there's a, a strong uh, mathematical basis that says that the, the first uh, however number of principal components that you pull out are in fact the the you know x number of most important trends through your data, and all of those are are totally independent trends. So so that's another nice part of using it as a pre-processing uh, step is that it not only uh, reduces the number of features that you have have but makes them all linearly independent, um, which which can be can be nice too. Um, in that uh, you, you, you don't get crosstalk between the features of your model now um, because you've, you've taken out all of the, the correlations they have with each other um, by, by only fitting the quote unquote residuals of, uh, of the, the first trend. Um, 
Some cons are that uh, since we're looking at uh, at linear combinations of features, which is to say our, our trend lines are roughly equivalent to multiple linear regression uh, through this space, uh, we miss any nonlinear relationships between data. Um, but uh, that's uh, that's uh, the, the case for almost any uh, pre-processing step. Um, and and if you expect you know highly nonlinear data, you're probably running it through a nonlinear model, uh, anyways. Uh, another big con is that uh, when you uh, take your principal component that has uh, some input from all of the features in your data set, um, and say now you've you know condensed it into the top one or two or three principal components, uh, it's virtually impossible to say what that component means um, because you've you've taken little bits of of all of the features and in, in, uh, in kind of crunched them together into one single column in your data set um, and so uh, if you're you're using this for uh, building a model or uh, or clustering your your data uh, the, the way that you're, you're going to end up making sense of the data is to feed in a new data point and see what the, the model ends up predicting it as, or for clustering to get your clusters by clustering in this PCA space, uh, but then, as we said, doing some descriptive data analysis on each of the clusters that you end up with. Um, and, and with that, you can say things about the raw features, not just the, the PCA features. If you're looking at, let's say, the average value of feature three in cluster number two, um, you can do that in your original data set instead of, uh, instead of doing it in your, your PCA transformation. So to, to sum up, um, we've, we've talked about uh, unsupervised learning here, which is a, a great approach for those of you who have projects that, uh, that don't have good or a lot of labeled training data, uh, but perhaps have more uh, unlabeled training data or unlabeled data. I guess you, you don't use it for training if, if you're not building a, a supervised learning model. Um, We've noted that uh, clustering is a, a great approach here uh, for pulling together similar data points into to groups that you can then describe and, and investigate as uh, the, these more specific, uh, hopefully more homogeneous groups than, than looking at uh, describing your whole data set at once, uh, which is a great way to do exploratory data analysis to, to figure out what your problem looks like, uh, or in many cases is also a a really valuable deliverable to you know your stakeholders of this data science project, just describing what groups and trends uh, exist in in this data. Um, and, and PCA and dimensionality reduction more generally is a, a great way of of finding uh, trends um, a, a, of your data, and, and is especially great as a, a pre-processing step to uh, to reduce the number of features uh, and, and give you a, a whole bunch of, of non-correlated features uh, that, that feed really nicely into, uh, into a, a whole bunch of uh, modeling types. Uh, for, for the sake of time, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's wrap it up here um, and, uh, and we'll, we'll see you uh, in class. Um, happy to, to take any questions. I, I know I went uh, pretty quickly over uh, a large scope of of uh, possible models in kind of all of unsupervised learning. Um, and I know I just highlighted a, a handful of, of approaches here, but hopefully it gives you, you some idea of the type of tools that, that you can use. Uh, and again, uh, looking at the, the unsupervised learning scikit-learn page uh, will hopefully give you ideas of, of some other similar approaches that, that you can try for, for your projects as well. Uh, great. Thanks, everyone, and we'll uh, see you online.